I firmly believe the gap, the biggest gap now in fundraising is between pre-seed and seed. Hey everyone, this is Prashant and I'll be your host for the VC 10X podcast and today we have Sam Merchant with us. Sam is an investment associate at Hambro Perks, an international investment firm investing in private technology companies leveraging different fund structures like venture capital, venture debt and secondaries etc. In this episode, we talk about Sam's story and how he got into investing, how investing is done differently at different funds at Hambro Perks, how different market conditions impact the activity levels of different fund types, what are the traits of product market fit, cap table blunders that founders should avoid, how should founders figure out the right valuation for their early stage startups, what should founders include in their investor updates, and so much more. So without wasting any time, let's dive straight in. This episode is sponsored by my own podcasting agency called Podcast 10X, where I help VCs start and run their own podcast. While I was running VC 10X, this podcast that you're listening to right now, I asked my VC guests, why don't you start your own podcast? I mean, it's the best form of marketing for VCs. As they say, VC is a people play more than even a capital play. A podcast enables you to put your people at the front, your portfolio founders, your partners and co-investors. It's a great way to build a brand and win competitive deals. It activates all your marketing channels in a single shot, be it YouTube or blog post or newsletter or social media. Everything gets activated in a single shot. And I get the same response from all the VCs that it's a lot of work and we don't have the time for it. I said, all right. Let me handle the work for you from pre-recording, editing, publishing to making social media clips. All you have to do is show up on a call, hit record, do the recording using the well-researched outline we provide you with and you're done. We handle everything else. You know what they said? All right, let's give it a shot. So if you are a VC and want to up your marketing and branding game, I'd love to work with you. And if you're thinking there are too many VC podcasts already, Remember, there are way more VC firms out there. And if you're not standing out, you're losing out. So if you want to work with me on starting your podcast, go to podcast10x.com and book a call today. I'll add the link in the description and show notes below. Look forward to working with you. Hey, Sam. So good to have you on the VC10x podcast. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. No, thank you, Prashant. It's, very, it's, uh, it's great to be here. I really uh, I appreciate you making the time to chat. It's always... Uh... They're always good fun conversations. Yeah. Thanks so much for making time. Uh, to start things off, can we first have your story and how you started investing? How I started investing? Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Very, very happy to, to, to rewind. So um, I was actually, uh, so I was a, a founder before being an investor. Um, and to be perfectly honest with you, I got very lucky. Um, I, I saw... Uh, an opportunity to join a, a team at Ascension Ventures, um, who are a very early stage fund uh, based here in London. Um, great firm, great team. Uh, I applied not knowing that actually it was for an ops associate role, um, which was uh, not not what I ended up doing. Um, and they came back to me and said, "Hey, you know, you're not you're not right for the role." Um, I said, "Okay, that's a bit of a shame. Um, that's fine." Um, and they said, "Well, actually, we you know we we'd like to carry on chatting, and we think that there might be an opportunity." So. And that kind of relationship just evolved. The conversation evolved and developed. Um, and yeah, and then I, I joined the the team at Ascension Ventures. This was back in 2021, uh, March, around this time last year, or around this time in, in March 2021. Um, and yeah, I joined them as an, an investment associate focused on the, the social inequalities fund that they had called the um, called the Fair by Design Fund. So yeah, and I was I was with the team there for about 18 months. Um, it was a, a, a really a, a really fun fun place to be. We did lots of early stage investing, as you can imagine, in 2021 and early 22. Um, the market the market was quite hot. And then um, and then I ended up joining a firm uh, and I left Ascension and joined a firm in, in kind of late 2022, joined a firm called Hambro Perks. Uh, now I've been at Hambro Perks um, yeah, kind of ever since then. So um, slightly different fund in terms of just size and, and structure. So HP, we have a wide range of different funds. We do everything from very early stage kind of primary equity, which is where I sit, all the way up to um, you know, secondary equity. And we also have a, a venture debt fund as well. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a larger fund in that respect. Um, but yeah, that's how, I, uh, that's how I broke into this space. Yeah. 
Yeah, totally. And uh, at Hambrook Perks, what's the investment thesis here and how is investing happening here? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's a very broad question as well. I mean, look, with, so for the early stage fund that we have, and which is the fund that I sit on, um, there are four of us uh, non-partner investors um, and we're all split. So we're verticalized. So we look after each kind of sector. Um, I look after future of work and productivity. Um, I have, and then my three colleagues, uh, they look after fintech and insure tech, uh, digital health and sustainability kind of respectively. So we have investment thesis areas in each of those verticals. That's why I say it's quite a, quite a broad question. Um, but for us, you know, we've, we believe that the big opportunity lies at the seed stage right now. Um, so we're primarily writing kind of 500 K to one, 1.5 million pound checks into to seed rounds. That's where our kind of our sweet spot is. Um, and, you know, we love exceptional, everyone says this, exceptional founding teams, right? So, so teams that have not only some level of domain expertise or technical expertise, but there's something about them. Um, you know, it's, it's funny when, you, when you've met enough founders, you start grooving it and you, you find, okay, there are these exceptional outlier individuals who, um, who, who kind of really bring a different energy, totally different perspective on something. Um, those are the people that we, that we like to back. Um, we're then looking for, from a product perspective, you know, is this a category defining kind of generational <laughs> defining product? You know, does this really move the needle? Um, we think that true innovation is really quite hard to come by. Um, so, you know, we meet a lot of products where it's incremental in terms of the value add to the end user. And, and we want to go a big, a big leap. So we try and think quite differently about product and disruption and finding the gaps um, and the opportunities we do look at. And then lastly, is just from a market perspective, you know, is this, is this a large enough market? And I know everyone says that, but again, you know, it, it's really important to us that these can be huge businesses, um, global from kind of day one. Um, but, you know, with the optionality to, to really focus, that's, um, that's kind of how we like to invest. Um, and look, we, we, we tend to like to lead rounds. Um, and the reason we do that, we have a lot of resource internally at HP. We have a great um, kind of ops legal team um, who, who, who get involved, but then also kind of, um, you know, non-execs and, and a broader network of really specialized individuals who have lots of experience in building companies, uh, exiting companies from a, a wide range of different verticals. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's big and broad in that sense. Totally. And Hambro Perks is like, there's so many things happening inside that one brand name, right? So, so, so many different types of investing that's happening. Yeah. Uh, so how does it feel being inside such a uh, big organization where they're managing multiple types of different types of funds, yeah. right? Multiple styles of investing, right? Yeah. So is, is there like a sharing of knowledge that's happening and do you look into how others are doing stuff, right? And how, how is it different from what you're de- doing here at Venture Investing? Right. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a great question. And um, I, we don't, I, don't, I don't talk about it enough, actually. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, I would say, our, our secret sauce, right, is, is what makes us totally unique. Um, every single day I go into the office and, um, you know, maybe not on a Friday because it's usually quite quiet. <laughs> Everyone's working from home. But if you go into the office and everyone is in, you know, literally, I am literally surrounded by exceptional people um, in every single team, in every single fund. Um, but then also those who are not investing as well, right? Those who are supporting portfolio or supporting just general ops at, at, at HP and everything that we're doing. Um, from a from a way that we like to invest, I think it's pretty synonymous with the brand. Um, so if you're speaking to venture debt, you're going to get the same experience as if you were speaking to you know us in the in the leaders fund in the primary equity vehicle. Same with the secondary equity team. Um, you know we're kind of coming in with that prepared mind piece um you know we understand areas we take time to know founders um we're not coming on and asking them to repeat themselves and go over decks again actually it's quite an informed conversation um and then we're you know we're leveraging a a broader network to to help us make our decisions but also to bring you know more value to the founders that we do end up backing um but it's great fun, right? Um, you know, I, I, I say this, we're recording this on a day where, you know, we had a, a company uh, a, a company social last night. You know, we all went go-karting. Um, great fun, right? It's, it's a very serious place to work. You know, we like to keep our standards incredibly high, the work rate incredibly high. Um, but then, you know, when you find time to, in this case, go on a go-kart track, you know, 
everyone is still super competitive, uh, which <laughs> which makes it really good fun. But no, it's 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 brilliant. I I I love the team, and I think um, I'm very privileged to work with you know individuals of of of, of such a high caliber. Right, absolutely. And uh, are all these different uh, sections and different funds operating completely independently, or there is a leadership that's guiding maybe the strategy of each of this uh, these funds? Because mm-hmm. different market environments can yeah. mean they mean different things for different funds, right? Like for sure. right now, for venture investing, right now maybe you can go slow, right? Yeah. Uh, but venture debt maybe right now might be a great time for them, right? Or secondary maybe yeah. that can be a great time for them, right? So how do you uh, think about that? Yeah, exactly. It, it's, again, another great question. It, it ebbs and flows, right? As you said, you know, last year um, was a slightly quieter year for us on a kind of primary equity team writing early stage checks. Um, whereas the venture debt team, you know, they were flat out. Same with the secondaries team, flat out. Um, so we operate, I guess, with our own investment strategies, which is led by, you know, the the, the managing partners on, on each of those different products or different funds. Um, but there's a lot of knowledge sharing that goes on. Right. Um, and that and that's what I mean, I guess, about it becoming synonymous that, you know, we're coming in with those uh, coming into the conversations with founders with you know, good questions. We understand the sectors, the verticals. You know, we've done our work already. Um, we're not we're not there to waste anyone's time. Um, I think as a firm, what I've noticed since since joining is that actually it's become increasingly collaborative as the market has changed and evolved. Um you know, there are different levels of activity, as you rightly mentioned, across those funds. But that means we get different levels of insight. Um, and it means different people are working on different things at different times, right? Um, you know, last year was a year of, for us specifically, follow on raises and follow on rounds within the early stage portfolio. So we spent a lot of time you know, crafting our relationships with downstream later stage investors. Um, obviously, you know, our venture debt teams and our secondary teams know those, know those funds very well. So yeah, it's, it's, it's sharing, it's relationship sharing and it's, and it's kind of building that collaborative approach. Um, at the same time, you know, we're obviously always testing ideas and funneling ideas. Um, I find that the growth stage companies that we have within the portfolio are often spinning off ideas or, um, testing things that actually are really early stage founders get a lot of value from understanding and meeting. So yeah, we try and push a lot of, a a lot of insight sharing across the firm. And I think that that is unique, right? It's something that only a large firm with multi kind of, yeah, loads of different products and different funds can actually can offer founders. Yes, I totally agree. Even some large VC funds can probably not offer that kind of well-rounded insight that's there in, in a, brand name that's actually managed different types of funds right mm. and has it ever happened that a company has pitched you and you say that okay it's not uh, not that relevant for the venture fund that we're deploying but yeah. you might the venture debt uh, the debt fund might be yeah. interested in you guys has it ever happened yeah it, that happens quite a lot and vice versa right um right. you know so right. It, 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 it comes down to the stage of the evolution of the company. Um, you know, right. we we have done Series A rounds historically. Now our focus is slightly more on, on the seed stage um, or the seed stage of kind of company development. So the Series A rounds that we have done previously, you know, naturally when you get into that phase, Series B and onwards, that's where we find um, companies are also starting to think about venture debt. So you know, one of the key things for, for us is that everyone at Hambro Perks understands how each fund works, right? The mechanics of secondary investing are very different from primary investing. Same with venture debt, right? Um, you know, how these funds return um, return capital to, to their LPs is, 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 is slightly different. And you have to understand um, the mechanics of how those things work. But you know, that enables us to actually then look at deals in a totally different way. And yeah, it has happened before where I've met founders and I've said, hey, this is probably a little bit too late stage for us. But given this level of IP, given this level of revenue, actually, I think you might be worth having a conversation with, you know, the venture debt team. Um, It's obviously pretty rare for a seed stage or series A founder to be like, oh, I want to do secondaries. <laughs> that doesn't happen so much. Um, but, you know, there is a lot of, of kind of, I guess, idea sharing that comes and deal flow sharing that comes just across the firm generally. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, totally. And uh, now that you're uh, focusing more on seed, I believe that mm. mo- most of the companies would not have achieved PMF. And that's it. They're still in that 
process of getting there. Uh, yeah. So how do you judge for that, that, that path for PMF and also what's the stage where you think it has achieved PMF? What are the traits that need to be there? Yeah, I, well, I think the thing is product market fit is so variable to each startup, right? Um, and what you'll find is that second time founders who have exited, and this is a, a quite a sweeping statement, but largely they know the dynamics of what product market fit looks and feels like from a startup, from a revenue and a product perspective within the startups that they've had previously. Um, first time founders tend not to know that unless they've worked at a startup that has kind of gone through that product market fit, um, you know, pre product market fit and then post kind of growth. Um, from our perspective, we're seeing the bar and the level change quite a lot. Um, so we're seeing seed stage companies come through now with products that are far more developed revenue and traction that is far higher than it was before. Um, and I posted this on, on LinkedIn recently that the, the bar has definitely changed and that I firmly believe the gap, the biggest gap now in fundraising is between pre-seed and seed. Because um, the pre-seed round where you have, especially here in the UK, when the sunset clause changed and SEIS allowances went up, you know, you have the capacity for angel investors to do larger rounds now. And for, for early stage founders, especially if it's a small founding team and you're a technical uh, founder or a technical co-founder, technical team. Um, you know, you're able to build and ship product a lot quicker than, than you probably were previously and actually within a pre-seed kind of raise amount. Um, that's exciting because it means that at the seed stage, we're seeing companies with just crazy metrics and crazy performance, right? Um, which is good. It makes it more competitive for sure. And it means that later stage funds are looking at it going, okay, well, actually <clears throat> the performance of these companies is, is, is as good as it should or as good as it needs to be at series, some series A. So actually, we can probably go earlier and probably invest earlier. So, so yeah, I think for us at seed stage, it, it tends to be pre-product market fit, but actually it's not pre-traction. Um, there's often some sort of revenue that's going on. Um, and actually, it's about drilling into, you know, not all revenue is the same. Um, so, you know, what is the quality of that revenue? Where's it coming from? And it's, I'm just asking, just saying these questions, basically, how did you get it, right? Um, you know, actually, what was the, the acquisition cost that came there? How repeatable is it? Um, how specific is it to a certain industry or geography or uh, user? Like, where's the scalability that kind of comes in there? So those are the questions that we're starting to ask. But, you know, product market fit naturally is, is a kind of, it evades founders consistently over and over again. And even when you've got it, it's something that changes and it evolves with not only product development, technical development and market development as well. You know, those, those things kind of come into play. So yeah, it's, it's very elusive. Um, but you certainly know when you have it, you know, you start to hear customers referring other customers. It's that kind of virality, um, that organic growth that kind of goes out of your control. Um, and it feels the easiest way to describe it is it feels like the friction points, start to really become removed you know you, you don't feel those as much anymore when it comes to acquisitions sales explaining the value proposition it just it clicks right it clicks and it makes sense um yeah that's that's how we view it and how we how we look at it from a seed stage perspective yeah some great insights there and uh, something you also posted about i think on linkedin is about that uh, family offices uh, can be a good source of funding for founders. That, that's a, there are yeah. growing, there's growing amount of wealth that's there in family offices there. So yeah. uh, tell me more about that and how that should be a key target for uh, founders fundraising as well. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, I mean, I, I find it an interesting observation within the market and how we're seeing it. So um, the way I think I've seen this evolve, or when I look at the data, how I've seen this evolve, you know, there are an increasing number of family offices that are being founded year on year. Um, the growth rate is very, very high from, you know, the early 2000s to where we are now. Um, originally, those family offices were allocating to venture capital managers themselves. So they weren't making direct investments. Now what's happening is the kind of recycling of capital that we're seeing and the redistribution. Um, we're seeing family offices get closer to founders. They're becoming more visible and they're becoming more infrastructurally open to actually receiving pitch decks, reviewing opportunities and making decisions, right? 
Um, and that is a big opportunity for founders because I, I firmly believe at the kind of pre-seed and seed stage, you know, you are obviously more open to angel investors, family offices, very early stage VC funds. Um, and from a family office perspective, you know, it would be foolish not to at least drill into who are the family offices that operate within your sector or your vertical or your space. Um, I think what we will see is the evolution of family offices that become um, very sector focused. And maybe this is quite linear thinking, but I, I do think that um, until we have, uh, until we get into full blown like wealth transfer mode, whereby we're seeing family offices move to a younger generation of, of kind of capital controller. Um, what we will have is individuals who have made their money in specific verticals and sectors looking to invest in the future of those sectors and those verticals, right? Um, and that's kind of inevitable, um, but that's quite an exciting thing. Um, you know, we have invested alongside family offices before directly onto cap tables because we know at the early stage they bring huge value to uh, to an early seed, a seed stage company, right? Um, you know, they can unlock not only introductions, but sector expertise, knowledge that you know, we don't have. We, we have generalist knowledge on how to run and scale startups, but not in deep domain expertise within those specific um, specific verticals and sectors. So, so that, I think, for me, is where I see the biggest opportunity from a family office perspective. If I was a founder fundraising, you know, I, I would be looking, I'd be having those conversations. Um, the only thing I would say that founders need to watch out for is that, you know, we're only now seeing this shift. So we're seeing family offices adopt the behavior of direct fund managers and, and you know, um, direct capital allocators. Um, that that shift will come with a lot of learnings and understandings of, okay, what's the best way to operate with early stage founders? How do we manage portfolios as they grow, especially when they're direct investments and we're not kind of one layer removed? Um, you know, what do we need to do to, to service those companies and support those founders? Those those will be big challenges as well, I think. Um, but no, I would encourage any any early stage founder who's thinking about fundraising to explore the, the family office gap because um, I do think there's a, a huge opportunity there. Yeah, totally. Uh, and one thing you also were uh, writing about uh, some days back is how uh, founders sometimes have messed up cap tables pretty early on and that really doesn't serve them well and some rounds can completely fall apart if your cap table isn't in yeah. place, right? Uh, so tell me about some uh, cap table blunders that probably you have seen that can potentially be avoided by founders because I think there is lack of awareness on that front. Yeah, for sure. It And look, it's a really contentious topic, right? Because, you know, you, you obviously have the camp of, uh, especially, you know, from an academic background, individuals who have, you know, spent a lot of money on research, research and development before companies have spun out, feel that they should be, you know, well incentivized and, and should have a large, a large shareholding on the cap table. The issue is, it just makes it really hard to invest as a, an investor, because you're looking at it going, you know, how incentivized are these founders fundamentally? That's that's the real core question, right? It's not because we don't like academic institutions. That's not the case at all. It's about saying, okay, what's the what's the kind of balance? What's the tipping point that we have to reach where founders go, there's just not enough in it for me anymore. Um, and if you take the, you know, if you, if you believe that, you know, early stage founders are everything in startups, you know, they, they make the startup themselves. Um, then you know you want those those individuals to be locked in and to be you know, well incentivized, well motivated to stay with the company. So that that's often the the biggest issue that we see. Um, the second thing I see quite often is actually advisors getting too much equity. Um, I think founders underestimate just how much uh, value they are giving away when they say, okay, yeah, I'm going to move up by one, two, even three percent. Right? It's it's a lot. Um, and when you consider that other investors are kind of coming in with their cash and what the cash can then do to the business, you know, you, you've got to put it in real kind of pound or dollar figures and say, okay, actually, where's the, where's the value driver here? Um, so that, that is a real big mistake that I see. Um, the other thing I think I see from an, uh, a cap table perspective, we get this a lot, is when, um, when founding teams don't join at the same time, and people think that, you know, I should be here, they should be there, and we kind of split this down. Um, that's really quite difficult. Um, and I'm a big believer that actually, 
you know, if, if someone has been working on the startup for longer than you, um, not only do you have to weigh up the value that they bring and how much they unlock for you to grow, um, but actually from a practical sense, you know, start, you know, it, it's not always, day one doesn't have to be launching, a setting up a company, putting it on a company's house and, <laughs> and issuing all the equity. You, you, you don't have to do that, right? That doesn't, that doesn't have to be day one. That should be when, you know, you need to have a legal entity because you have to open something specific to, 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 to enable the business to go. Um, so I, I think it was it's something that I challenge a lot of founders and I'm seeing a lot of individuals now, exceptional, really talented people who are building incredible products as like a side hustle. And they're going, oh, I'm thinking of bringing this person in as a co-founder and they haven't set up the business yet. And I say, OK, well, you really need to have a conversation very clearly about equity split and, and what people uh, and what people's expectations are because you know un unless you have a candid conversation and you're up front and say this is what i expect or this is what i think is fair you know you don't understand people's position um and that and that's a nasty that's a nasty situation so but yeah cap tables cap tables can be quite messy um because people can get quite territorial over it um but then also people go the other way and they just say oh no I, i'm just not going to fight about it it's fine um, I, I don't care, you know, I've only got a percent or whatever. And you think, no, that's also not right because it's saying, you know, something about the other is in, uh, the other individuals who are on the cap table. So it's a, it's a, it's a very tricky one, but ultimately it comes down to, um, for future fundraising rounds, you know, what is the equity requirement that you need to make the cap table attractive to, you know, an institutional investor like us at, at Hambro Perks, you know, so that there's, um, so that there's nothing that kind of puts us off, um. I think the best, if anyone is, you know, if anyone wants to look at cap table management and how to structure cap tables, I would encourage people to have a look at the cap tables, if you can, of uh, any venture studio or venture builder um, kind of spin outs. And the reason I say that is because the emergence of really high performing uh, venture studios and venture builders has happened largely because those companies are able to be funded by institutional investors in subsequent rounds, right? And that means that those venture builders and venture studios are saying, okay, we're not going to try and take 80% of the equity now. We're going to take 20 to 30%. We're going to give founders, we're going to put founders in the right position so that they're building, they're incentivized with us. And then we're going to put it out to the market as if we've just done the pre-seed round. And that, again, that mindset shift, um, that's what's kind of propelling those companies forward as well. So, but cap tables are a very contentious issue, like uh, like most things in startups, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. And advisory shares is something that I've actually never understood the point of, uh, yeah. because if you're being getting on the cap table, you it's it's you get a share of the company and you yeah. ha have to help that company succeed by default, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But how how do the advisory advisory shares actually work in practice? Do they like materialize over time? How does that happen? Yeah, so I mean, most, I mean, all advisors should have vesting schedules, in my opinion, always. Um, right. You know, I, I think it's unreasonable to just give the equity off the bat. And again, I've seen founders make that mistake, right? Um, you know, lock it up, boom, 6% straight away. You never hear from that individual again. You know, nightmare scenario, right? It's essentially dead equity on the cap table. Um, so yeah, all advisors should have some sort of vesting schedule um, on, on the equity that they have. Typically, you'd be looking at a kind of, you know, three to four year vesting period with what's called a one year cliff. Um, you know, that would be pretty standard. Um, if you're thinking about advisor equity and how to kind of uh, what levels you should be giving away, I'd in encourage you to go and have a look at Carter. Um, they have some great, you know, data metrics on actually where advisor equity is across all of the fundraising rounds and cap tables that they see and they manage. Um, so people should people should go and have a look at that. Um, but no, advisory shares, um, yeah, they should always be tied to a vest. Some are often tied to key deliverables. Um, I don't think I'm against that. I just think in the nature of startups, you know, when, when you incentivize someone like that, if they need to change or they have to get involved in something else, because that's more pressing at the time, um, you know, you need to think about how dynamic and flexible those incentives and those focus points are going to be. Um, because yeah, startups change, they evolve and they, and they develop, right? Everyone who's been involved with a startup knows that. Right. Totally. That's helpful there. Uh, and when uh, early stage founders go out for fundraising, right? Mm. They are figuring out what should be the valuation of my company at this point, <laughs> right? What's my valuation? Should, should I just let the investor decide my valuation, right? 
So yeah. tell us how should founders be thinking about valuations, especially in the early stages when there is maybe pre-revenue stage at that stage or not yeah. minimal revenue. How should they be deciding the valuation in their first round of fundraise? I get this question a lot. <laughs> a lot, a lot of a lot of founders ask me this. Um and I and I say I think you need to think about valuation um in terms of dilution, um, but also in terms of and I say this now, I don't think people thought about this, you know, in, in twenty end of twenty twenty, twenty one and then even early twenty two. Um, but you should be thinking about revenue multiples, right? Um in an early stage startup where there is no revenue, obviously it's very hard to then say, okay, this is where the multiple is going to be. But in the current market, the current climate, those rounds are getting done at lower valuations. That's just the the, the nature of the game. Um, you know, when you're at that kind of pre-seed, pre-seed seed, and um, even, even to some respect, series A stage, you know, you're talking anywhere from 15 to 25% dilution that is is typically market standard right um it's pretty widely understood that that's where where these levels are going to be um any more than that i would say okay that's probably because the total round size is much higher um and therefore obviously you're exposing more capital to 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 risk and therefore you're you're kind of adjusting the price from there um for me founders often get hung up on valuations more than they do the the terms of the deal um, and that's something to to be aware of as well is that, you know, if I price the company at I don't know a, a five million pre money and 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 you do you do exactly the same, but our terms are wildly different. You know, there are pref stacks in, you know, there are um, voting rights, there's the governance, there's board control, points, etc. You know, all of a sudden it changes the deal quite dramatically, um, and founders often fixate on that valuation number um, because that's when it's very easy to say, okay, I own X of, of Y and therefore that that's how much money I'm, I'm on paper worth. Um, so I think founders should, should, should be aware of that as well. Um, that that's quite a, quite an important point, I guess, in, in my mind, but valuations are, are always market kind of sensitive. Um, one of the things I encourage founders to do is to, to not put valuations on pitch decks. Um, I think it often, I, I don't think I've ever seen, evaluation on a pitch deck where i've gone yeah that seems about right or that's just or that's you know they're always way way too high <laughs> um and and it just it sets the tone that you probably don't know you know, you, you know probably not in touch with the market and where this is um and sure that could be a great negotiation tactic but for investors who are looking at 15 to 20 pitch decks a day it's one reason to say no to you very quickly um you know so you, you've got to be aware of that yeah, totally. And uh, one uh, etiquette that uh, investors always teach founders is that you should be writing regular investor updates, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, what do you think should founders be including in that investor update? And what's the right frequency for them to send out this update? I think the most common frequency I see is monthly, right? Um, and monthly is when you're sharing key metrics that you're just tracking as you move along. Um, I think you should always include the good alongside the bad, um, you know, because often these investor updates are to look at, yes, the performance of the business. But you're also, if you, if you understand startups, you're looking at it saying, OK, how is this founder thinking and how are they feeling and how is the team thinking and feeling as well? Um, and, you know, from a from a portfolio company reporting, you know, at HP, you know, we use a lot of data to make sure that we're very clued up on the performance of the companies. But then we spend a lot of time with our founders as well, right, to try and get a read on, okay, how are they feeling? Um, you know, and, and that's the role of an investor as well is when you recognize someone is either stressed or burnt out, or, you know, they maybe need a break, or you can step in and try and help with a situation that's really weighing on them. Um, that's the kind of important role of, of an investor. But always, always include data. Um, so, you know, there's lots of uh, lots of kind of posts out there and lots of information out there as to, you know, if you're a B2B SaaS startup, you should be including um, from a consumer startup perspective. You know, it, it's slightly different. But again, it's the same. You need to you need to leave with the data. Um, I think people that hide data or use, you know, points of, of reference, like, OK, our, our, our growth was X percentage this month. You know, it's a really high percentage. You go, OK, yeah, we're going from zero to 10 is, <laughs> you know, we can see how that goes. And it, it, it's just a bit, uh, it kind of hides the, the true underlying numbers. 
Um, so it's important to just be upfront and honest. Um, and then the last piece of advice I would say is that really, um, really share the bad as openly and as honestly as you can. Um, every time I've seen an investor update where the bad hasn't been, you know, it's, it's pretty patchy or there are gaps. Um, if you speak to the founder, it's usually because there's something that they're angry about or something they're embarrassed about. Um, put that down. In, investors know how hard it is to build startups, right? Or, or you know, most investors do. Um, so, you know, no, no, you're not kidding anyone. We, we know how difficult it is. We understand that. Um, we just much rather it was honest and open about it because um, ideally we can help you. We can help you with that situation or that challenge or that problem, whatever you're facing. You know, we're there to help. That's that's the role. So, yeah, always include the bad alongside the, the good as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Like most investors know that it's extremely hard out there and you're trying to make it work somehow. So, yeah. And if, if you share those uh, bad news with them, then they can probably come in and help in some way, maybe connect you with someone who can help, right? Exactly. So, yeah, so that's always a good thing. Uh, all right, so coming to my last main question before we move on to the rapid fire round, and this one is about what's been your biggest learning investing into startups over the years? My biggest learning investing in the startups over the years? It's a great question. I think the biggest learning for me is that it sounds so obvious startups are incredibly hard <laughs> um and i think when you're on the investor when you're on the founder side you only see your problems and the problems that are in front of you whether it be you know, product team customer whatever it may be um from an investment perspective you have to be comfortable absorbing quite a lot of problems here problems there problems everywhere <laughs> um and that can be quite energy draining and it can be quite challenging in respect to it contributes into the like long feedback cycles and loops that we have within this within this industry. Um, and if you're someone who's very, you know, motivated by good outcomes and, and seeing wins kind of evolve and develop, um, it can often be a, a, a tricky place to be. Um, and I think that, you know, we all know that startups are, are very difficult and very hard, but actually founders often forget that VCs are not the people who make, you know, who, who bring this, who create huge amounts of value and deliver huge returns. It's the startup founders themselves who do that. Um, and, you know, it's very easy for VCs to turn up and say, hey, we did this, you know, and, and really take all the glory. But actually the best investors I've ever worked with um, or have observed are the ones who are, you know, very, very focused on the founders themselves, looking after their founders, making sure they're okay, making sure they're developing and can they be there to help with anything at, at any time? That's where the, the focus lies. So yeah, my, my big learning has been, um, it's just reinforced the startups are incredibly difficult uh, to do and that actually you should always focus on the individual. Um, that's, that's a really important thing because yeah, every time I've seen a, an exceptional founder, and I've been like, oh, I'm worried about something else. Like they, they always seem to prove me, prove me wrong. Um, and that's a key point, right? You, you can't, you can't know everything on this, this side of the table as a VC, um, you know, especially when you're a generalist investor. So, you know, you're looking for those, those outliers, those individuals who bring something truly special um, and, you're, and you're backing them. That's what, that's what's important. Totally, totally agree. Founders are the real heroes here. hundred <laughs> percent. Awesome. Uh, now let's do the rapid fire round wherein I'll ask you five quick questions about the leaders fund at Hambro Perks. Cool. And you have to give five quick answers, right? So the Sounds first good. one is what are the sectors and regions you invest in? So we focus on primarily UK and EU, and we're looking to invest in fintech, insurtech, uh, digital health, sustainability, and then what we call future of work and productivity. Um, those are the four, I guess, key verticals we're really after. Um, but we're generalist investors, right? So yeah, we're always there to be wow. Right. What's the typical stage of investment? Seed stage. What's the typical check size? A million pounds. Where can founders apply for funding in case there's a direct way? Either directly on LinkedIn or uh, any member of the team or right. online through our website we have a form and we do check the form um it goes into all of our buckets and we're responsible for looking after our buckets so yeah online right last one where can our listeners follow you 
LinkedIn is probably best. That's where I'm most active. Um, I don't do social yeah. media apart from LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're good at it, right? That's, that's what matters, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sam. I'll make sure to put all those links in the show notes below. And I wish you happy investing. Thank you, Prashant. It's been great to chat. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much.